This is Al Jazeera. Adrian Finnegan here in Doha with a news hour uh, with coverage of the most intense exchange of fire between Israel and Palestinian armed groups in years. An Israeli airstrike has hit a residential tower in Gaza City. The army says that it informed residents of uh, Hanadi Tower to evacuate before it was targeted. Gaza's health ministry says that at least 28 Palestinians have been killed across the Strip. There had been warnings uh, throughout the day that if Israel decided to uh, attack residential buildings, uh, where it had said that it had already uh, attacked Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters in one apartment building, uh, this building is said to have housed a, a Hamas office of some kind. Uh, Jordan's foreign minister has told the virtual session that Israel's aggression and its violation of international law will only fuel the conflict and push it to explosion. Qatar's foreign minister, who chaired the session, says the Israeli bombing of Gaza is a condemned and unacceptable criminal attack. And the Arab League's Secretary General, Ahmed Abu Gate, has asked the UN Security Council to act over what he called the blatant violation by Israel of international uh, resolutions. This is traditionally a very thorny issue for the Council. We know that uh, Russia, uh, Norway and Tunisia yesterday suggested a statement calling for calm and an end to the, the violence there. This is still being discussed. The United States has said that it does not want to do anything to exacerbate the situation, uh, suggesting that a statement might in fact do that, exacerbate the situation. So we are uh, essentially at an impasse in the Security Council unless they can come to some agreement later on today. But for now, uh, strong words from the President of the General Assembly, condemnation of uh, attacks on Israel from the Secretary General, uh, and wait and see what happens with the Security Council. The price that Gaza pay, that Palestinians in Gaza pay, is always much higher. And so I hope this thing stops because uh, Netanyahu's uh, cynical, uh, I would even say sadistic use of Israel's advanced weapons against uh, uh, the mostly unsheltered people of Gaza uh, will, de will lead to a lot of uh, uh, mayhem and destruction. But just like every other conflict that you and I and everyone else covered over the last few years and decades, we will go back to point zero in the sense that there is no military solution to this kind of tension, to this kind of uh, 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 conflict, if you will. There is no political solution to this conflict. That's what we have just heard. As tensions mount globally over what's happening in Israel, our world is bewildered at the speed at which the conflict in Israel has escalated over the past few days. People all over the world are searching for answers. Who's to blame? Who's right? Who's wrong? And we are being driven into taking sides. Are we for the Israelis or for the Palestinians? This escalating conflict in Israel is known in scripture as Israel's labor pains. So when a woman falls pregnant from the time of conception to the time of birth, is 40 weeks. During those 40 weeks she might suffer some discomfort but for the most part she's not in pain. It is only when her waters break and the baby is engaged in the birth canal that she goes into labor. And during this period of a woman's experience that pain increases and increases and increases until finally uh, the baby is born and that is what's happening to our world and we need to focus on the land of Israel for the things that will bring about a new birth. The Apostle Paul has this to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and the first three verses but concerning the times and the seasons brothers you have no need that I should write unto you for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. 
So whilst Israel, and indeed most of the world, will suffer intensely through the process of childbirth, we need always to keep focus on the end result, and that is the birth of the child, bringing new life, new hope, and ultimately a new government. Jesus has an interesting view on childbirth. He says in John 16 verse 21, A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. And that's exactly what happens as women give birth all over the world. Once their babies are born, all the pain, all the suffering, all the anguish, all the labor pains just melt away. Now the prophet Isaiah, writing about 750 years before Jesus was born, has this to say about childbirth, especially in relationship to the land of Israel. He writes in chapter 66 and at verse 7, Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? And here notice that the word earth in Hebrew is the word Eretz, which more often than not relates to the land of Israel. For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Notice the language carefully, that what is happening in this world, the world is going into labor pains. Those labor pains are to be felt in Israel. Isaiah 66 and verse 9, Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says Jehovah? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says your God? I mean, this is an incredible question that he's raising. I mean, every time a woman falls pregnant, goes through the whole gestation period of 40 weeks. I mean, how hopeless would it be if she never gave birth? But verse 10 says, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. Isn't that what it's all about? A mother's comfort as she feeds her child and as the child feeds from her breast. We witness now the birth pangs. God is using his megaphone. He's telling us, through the news media of the world and the events that are unfolding in, in Israel at the moment, that the birth pangs have started. But we, we need to focus, we need to look forward to that great joy when the kingdom of God is born. Born out of Zion, born out of Israel. God is saying, watch Israel, pay careful attention to what is happening. Now, in a metaphorical sense, Israel is the womb of the world. The birth pangs will be felt more intensely in Israel so that the kingdom of God can be born out of Israel. To help us understand uh, some of the events that are unfolding in Jerusalem at the moment, uh, we want to look at the prophet Zechariah. But before we do, we need to just look at one or two prophetic principles which are important. Uh, the first one is... Uh, recorded for us in Deuteronomy 11 and in verse 12, that Israel is a land for which Jehovah your God cares. The eyes of Jehovah your God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the very end of the year. So this is a very special land as far as God is concerned, the God of Israel. He cares for Israel. He, he looks at that land from one end of the year even to the other. And again, for this is what Jehovah of hosts says, uh, for he who touches you, touches the apple of his eye. Now you know what it would feel like if you had to touch the cornea of your eye. It would be irritable, it would be sore, it would cause pain. And that's what happens when people touch Israel. When people touch Israel, it's like touching the apple 
of God's eye. It's an irritation which he will deal with. 2 Peter chapter 1 and at verse 20 through 21 we read, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So right now we're going to be looking at Zechariah. And Zechariah was one of those prophets that was moved by the Holy Spirit to write the things that he wrote. So in the light of what's happening in Israel right now, as Israel goes into labor, let's examine one of the possible scenarios that could be unfolding to herald the birth of the kingdom of God. Uh, the prophet Zechariah is a post-exilic prophet, uh, writing after the Jews returned from their exile in Babylon. So while some of his prophecies could relate to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, most of them will relate to the present day events as we see them unfolding in Israel right now. So here is one of the sequences that uh, Zechariah presents to us. The first one that we want to consider is that Jerusalem is a burdensome stone. And this is the catalyst that will entice all nations into conflict. Reading Zechariah 12 and at verse 3, And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all peoples. All who will heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered unto it. The second part of the sequence is when all nations come up to Jerusalem for battle. Zechariah 14 and verse 2, For I will gather all nations, the Hebrew word there is the word goyim, I will gather all goyim to battle against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses rifled, the woman raped, and half the city will go into captivity. This will lead to Armageddon, this great global conflict, Armageddon. Zechariah 12 and at verse 11, in that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadadrimon in the plain of Megiddo. Megiddo is another word for Armageddon. The fourth part of the sequence is that as a result of Armageddon, as a result of all the goyim of the world, that is uh, America, that is England, that is Europe, that is Russia, that's Australia, New Zealand, that is Africa, all the Goyim, all the nations, as a result of that, as a result of Armageddon, two-thirds of Israel's population will die. Zechariah 13 and verse 8 reads, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says Jehovah, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. And the one-third that survives will be uh, refined as silver is refined and tried as gold is tried. And so Zechariah 13 and at verse 9 reads, I will bring one third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined. I will test them as gold is tested. And as a result, they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. And how is this going to happen? This is going to happen by God pouring upon Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And so in Zechariah 12 and at verse 10, I will pour out upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And what is grace? Grace is undeserved kindness. And how is this going to happen? Well, we are told in uh, Zechariah 12 and at verse 10 that they will recognize Jesus. Jesus will make himself known to his brothers the second time. They will look unto me whom they have pierced. The American Standard Version says they shall look unto me whom they have pierced. This is when uh, the remaining Israelis, those that have been refined, those that have been tested, those that, that God is still working with, the remnant that we find in the rest of Scripture, the remnant that are to be saved, 
they now see the wounds in Jesus' hands, the wounds in his side. They shall look unto me whom they have pierced. And so Jesus reveals his identity to his brothers the second time. And notice that this pattern comes straight out of Genesis. And Genesis, the story of Joseph. If you follow the story of Joseph, you will understand the spirit of prophecy. And so Jesus reveals himself to his Israeli brothers the second time. And so Zechariah 12 and at verse 10, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Again, like Joseph, his Israeli brothers are filled with remorse and mourn for what they have done to their savior over the centuries. And their mourning will be greater than the mourning for those that they have lost during the great battle of Armageddon. And so Zechariah 12 and verse 11 and 12, in that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddo. That's Armageddon. And all the land shall mourn, every family apart and their wives apart. Every individual that survives, every individual will see and understand and feel and repent and mourn for what they have done to their Messiah over the centuries. The tenth part of the sequence is once the Israelis, that's the natural olive branches which Paul talks about in Romans 11, are united with their fellow spiritual Jews, that's the wild olive branches which are grafted contrary to nature into the natural olive tree, which again is recorded for us in Romans chapter 11. Together they will be caught away to be with Jesus and will join him as his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 and verse 3, then Jehovah will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. You'll remember in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended up into heaven, he ascended from the Mount of Olives, specifically from Bethany, which is on the east side of the Mount of Olives. As Jesus ascended, you'll remember the angel said, why gaze ye up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you up into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives, and here we see him returning to the Mount of Olives. What a beautiful prophecy this is. And this is written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And here, this beautiful prophet is telling us about his return when his feet stand upon the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. After this, we find that those nations that were enticed into the conflict with Israel are to be destroyed. And then we're going to have a new government, this beautiful new government that we, we pray for when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And here it is, the kingdom of God established under the kingship of Jesus and his saints. This is the new government that God has promised from the beginning of time. And so Zechariah 14 at verse 5, Thus Jehovah my God will come and all the saints with you. And finally, Jerusalem to be rebuilt upon her ancient landmarks. There's going to be lots to do in the kingdom of God. Jerusalem is going to be resurrected upon her ancient landmarks. These landmarks are recorded for us, by the way, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 3 and Nehemiah chapter 12 as the exiles came back from Babylon. Zechariah 14 and verse 10, Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hanaliel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. What a beautiful vision. What a beautiful time to look forward to. The 14th part of the sequence deals with the surviving nations. All the surviving nations will then be invited to go up to Jerusalem from year to year to worship the king and to celebrate the great feast of tabernacle the great feast of tabernacles from the book of leviticus is all about the great harvest 
the great ingathering, because that is the hope of the mortal populations that live during the millennial period, during the kingdom of God. And so Zechariah 14 and verse 16 reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, of course, not everybody's going to do that. Not all nations are going to obey. And, of course, um, Jesus will deal with them in a specific way. Those nations that refuse will receive no rain. And so, verse 17, we read, And it shall come to pass, whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, upon them there will be no rain. And so finally, Jerusalem will be at peace. And that's what Jerusalem means. In Hebrew, the word Yerushalayim means not the city of peace, but the vision of peace. No more pain. No more suffering. No more labor pains. The child is born. A world of love. A world of compassion and holiness. A world of peace. And so, as we come to the end of this incredible prophecy of Zechariah, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness unto Jehovah of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Jehovah of hosts. What an incredible prophecy. What an incredible hope as we pray for these things to come. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.